Good afternoon and welcome to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting and Maritime Uses. I am Council Member Adrian Adams, the Chair of this Subcommittee. We are joined today by Council Members Ku, Barron and Menchaca. Today we will be holding public hearings. Today we will be holding public hearings and voting on six landmark designations by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Okay, hearing seven and voting on six. LU-115 is a designation of the Emmett Building located at 95 Madison Avenue in Manhattan as a historic landmark. A 16-story limestone and terracotta office building constructed between 1911 and 1912, it is located in Council Member Rivera's district supported by Council Member Rivera. LU-116 is the designa designation by the Landmarks Preservation Commission of the Hotel Seville, now the James Nomad Hotel located at 22 East 29th Street in Manhattan. As a historic landmark, it is located in Council Member Powers District, supported by Council Member Powers. LU-117 and 1118 and 1119 are three landmark designations in Council Member Ayala's district, supported by Council Member Ayala. LU-117 is the designation as a historic landmark of Public School 109, now El Barrio Art Space PS 109, located at 215 East 99th Street in Manhattan. The building was constructed in 1899 as a school. Since 2015, the building has been used as affordable housing and studio space for local artists. LU-118 is the designation of the Benjamin Franklin High School, now the Manhattan Center for Science and Mathematics, a two-block-long brick and limestone Georgian revival building located at 260-300 Pleasant Avenue in Manhattan. LU-119 is the designation of the Richard Weber Harlem Packing House located at 207-15 each one East 119th Street in Manhattan. Constructed in 1895, the building was formerly a meat market that was part of a larger slaughterhouse, meatpacking, and retail complex. LU-120 is the designation by the Landmarks Preservation Commission of the Dr. Maurice T. Lewis House as a historic landmark. The building is located at 404 55th Street in the Sunset Park section of Brooklyn and Council Member Menchaca's district, supported by, by Council Member Menchaca. Constructed as a mansion in 1907, the Dr. Maurice T. Lewis House was later converted into an apartment building. Lastly, LU-121 is the designation by the Landmarks Preservation Commission of the Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg as a historic landmark. Completed in 1908, it is located at 209 Havemeyer Street on Williamsburg Bridge Plaza in Council Member Reynoso's district. Representatives of the landmark uh, Preservation Commission will testify on all of these items, followed by testimony by the public. We will now have comments by Council Member Menchaca. Uh, and I don't want to spend too much time, but say thank you, uh, not just to our chair uh, for her incredible work here, but um, for the LPC and, and their work uh, to to do the, the right thing in, in so many parts of our district. There's so many on the on the docket today. I will say though that um, the Dr. Maurice T. Lewis House uh, was one that 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 really kind of set a really great tone in communication, conversation, partnership with community. Uh, when we heard about the demolition permit, uh, we also realized that the work that we had been doing in Sunset Park, uh, a warm relationship between uh, the city uh, and the community, came together uh, and swiftly, quickly came came to the rescue. So I'm here to just to say thank you, uh, and then also thank you to this committee for uh, for the continued and official nod, yes, uh, to preserve this property. Thank you. Oh, council member, you're good? Okay, all right. Okay, <laughs> we're waiting for you. I, I saw you really, really into it, so I, didn't, I wanted to make sure we didn't miss anything. Okay, thank you very much, council member Menchaca. Okay, um, I will now open uh, 
the public hearings on these items. Uh, LPC, you are here. Please, um, council, please swear in the panel, and LPC can introduce themselves. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? I do. Um, well, good afternoon, Chair Adams and subcommittee members. My name is Lisa Kersavage. I'm the Director of Special Projects and Strategic Planning at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. And I'm here to present seven uh, recent designations by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Um, I'll do them one at a time, I understand, and stop in between each one, um, if, if that's okay. Um, okay, great. And uh, I just want to give you a heads up that um, for brevity, I've, it's a little bit shorter than what you have in the testimony. Um, so we're going to start in um, Madison Square North. Um, LPC has been analyzing the area around Madison Square North Historic District to identify potential individual landmarks, and the Hotel Seville and the Emmett Building were both standout buildings in our evaluation. Facing each other across Madison Avenue at 29th Street, just north of the Historic District, they are architecturally significant early 20th century structures. I will start with the Hotel Seville, which is a distinctive Beaux-Arts style hotel, notable for its elegant architecture and its importance within the development of New York City hotels during the 20th century. The hotel exhibits the classic composition and exuberant ornament features that were popular for hotels and apartment buildings at the time of construction. On March 6, 2018, the commission voted to designate Hotel Seville, now the James Nomad Hotel, as an individual landmark following a public hearing held on February 20th, 2018. At the public hearing and in written testimony, the commission received support from 10 organizations and individuals, including a representative of the property owner, council member Kalos, state senator Kruger, assembly member Gottfried, and representatives from Community Five, the Historic Districts Council, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, the Society for Architecture of the City, 29th Street Neighborhood Association, and the Metropolitan Chapter of the Victorian Society. The commission did not receive any testimony opposing designation. The hotel is located at the southwest corner of Madison Avenue and East 29th Street, north of Madison Square Park. The landmark site, with an L-shaped footprint, includes the hotel's corner section that opened in 1904, um, and the through block annex completed a few years later in 1907. Like similar hotels built north of Madison Square, the Hotel Seville reflects the neighborhood's evolution from affluent residential row house blocks into a bustling commercial and business district. The hotel catered to both permanent and um, permanent residents and visitors. Harry Allen Jacobs designed the 12-story corner section of the hotel that was completed in 1904. During his career, he designed many New York City buildings, including several that are now landmarks. Charles T. Mott, another New York City architect and brother-in-law of the owner, designed the three-block annex that was completed a few years later in 1907. As seen in the middle photograph, the annex is only one story shorter, but continues the earlier Beaux-Arts design. As you can see in the photo on the left, the Hotel Seville's distinctive striped limestone and red brick provides a backdrop for French-inspired sculptural details. The handsome building, today known at the, as the James Nomad Hotel, remains a striking example of the Beaux-Arts style with finely crafted details that enliven the facades and contribute significantly to the streetscape of the Madison Square North neighborhood. Given the significance of the Hotel Seville, we recommend that the City Council uphold, uphold this designation. Oh, do all of them. Okay, gotcha. Ninety-five Madison Avenue, also known as the Emmett Building, is a sixteen-story office building designed by the firm of Barney and Colt for Dr. Thomas Addis Emmett in nineteen twelve. With its neo-Renaissance decoration and neo-Gothic vertical elements that embody the earliest 20th century skyscraper style in New York City, the Emmett Building is an outstanding example of commercial architecture. On March 6, 2018, the Commission voted to designate 95 Madison Avenue, uh, the Emmett Building, as an individual landmark following a public hearing held on February 20th, 2018. At the public hearing and in written testimony, the Commission received support from 10 organizations and individuals, including the property owner, State Senator Kruger, Assemblymember Gottfried, Councilmember Kalos, 
and representatives of Community Board 5, the Historic Districts Council, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, the Society for the Architecture of the City, the 29th Street Neighborhood Association, and the Victorian Society of the American Metropolitan New York Chapter. Uh, the commission did not receive any testimony opposing designation. 95 Madison Avenue is located between East 28th and 29th Street. Um, the building was built for Dr. Thomas Addis Emmett, widely recognized as an important gynecological surgeon in the 19th century. Um, in the early 1900s, as new businesses were entering the area north of Madison Square, Dr. Emmett and his son formed a real estate company and replaced four row houses with this building. Primarily a commercial structure leased to tenants for wholesale showrooms, it also contained Dr. Emmett's penthouse apartment on the top floor. For Dr. Emmett, um, the architects designed a 16-story building that consisted of 15 floors of open commercial space that could be adapted to the tenants' needs for offices and showrooms. The steel frame building is clad in limestone on the first three floors and terracotta on the upper floors. The Emmett Building's extravagant decoration and overarching verticality were meant to distinguish it um, within the city's newest business district. Owned and operated by another family since the 1940s, the Emmett Building is a remarkably intact and extremely well-maintained um, example of the early 20th century commercial architecture in New York and a prominent reminder of the development of the area north of Madison Square Park. Given the significance of the Emmett Building, we recommend that the City Council uphold this designation. Okay, thank you. We're going to pause right here and we are going to hear uh, remarks from Council Member Rivera. Thank you, Chair Adams and all the committee members for the opportunity to testify today. So I am the Councilwoman for District 2, a district that includes 95 Madison Avenue, known as the Emmett Building, and I want to first thank the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission for designating this building an individual landmark. I have visited the site and find the structure striking and unique. As noted by the LPC, this structure dates to 1912 and represents the rich and complex history of New York. Initially envisioned by Dr. Thomas Addis Emmett, as was mentioned, this 16th floor building has vertical tiers of terracotta that are adorned by medieval ornaments and took inspiration from a combined early French Renaissance and neo-Gothic style. And thank you so much for your presentation, your very detailed presentation. It is based on architectural mix of traditional European styles, much like our city itself, while resulting in one spectacular single product. Typically, the top of a skyscraper of that era was designated a consodio space, but Dr. Emmett built an ornate residential penthouse at the top of a New York commercial building, which creates an early example of live-work space. As the rest of the area became the forefront for new commercial development, 95 Madison transformed to pure commercial use. Its change in use along with the neighborhoods reflected our city's evolution through the industrial and now innovation ages. It is for these reasons that I support LPC's designation of the Emmett Building as a landmark, and I ask this committee to support it as well. We do look forward to working with all stakeholders and agencies involved to address concerns, and I look forward to working with you all to push this application through. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Council Member Rivera. Thank you for being here today. Uh, at this time, we are going to excuse the panel temporarily. Mm -hmm. And we are going to ask any members of the public wishing to testify with regard to this item to please come, to please come. Rita, is it Rita Sklar? Yes, yes ma'am. Sklar, thank you very much for being here today to testify before this panel. I'm going to ask for five minutes on the clock. Okay, thank you very much. You may begin. Uh, dear uh, Mr. Mann and the Council Committee, my property, 95 Madison Avenue, 85858, has recently been calendared and designated as a landmark property. My experience these last few weeks has shocked me. I have discovered that the LPC is a sewer of influence peddling, shady practices, meetings conducted in secret behind owner's back and with no notification before or after such meetings 
with people who have special influence with New York politicians and agency, agencies, with plans reviewed by LPC that do not conform to any of the LPC rules and standards and which were not summarily rejected by LPC staff members, and where submitted and stamped dated as received applications vanish from LPC files in part or in their entirety and attached documents to an owner signed application do not match the description sent owner from an LPC staff staffer in a letter which was purported to be a copy of paperwork in their files. <coughs> Specific differences include date of receipt and approved differ by one month from approved applications in owner's possession. Owner filed three applications, sprinkler with no attachments, architectural with seven page attached, all regular or legal size, MEP structural, etc., as a third with the same uh, attachments as in the architectural. But LPC staffers only sent a copy of the architectural above and description in staffers' first letter to me shows four attachments of which a few are large scale, none of which I reviewed or approved. I respectfully request that I be permitted to complete and submit a complete documented history of what occurred and that my file be guaranteed to be forwarded to the city agency tasked with investigating and prosecuting all people within LPC, other city agency, and who used influence peddling to circumvent the rules, regulations, and the mission of LPC. LPC's chair, who recently resigned, did not do so to spend more time with her family, but rather under mounting pressure from groups in the city, uh, uh, in the city committed to landmark preservation with integrity from all employees of LPC and the designation of approval of plans based solely on LPC rules, regulations, and standards, and by quality personnel educated in landmark properties and their restoration and preservation and with years of professional work in the field, not just bureaucratic political hacks with neither experience, expertise, or commitment to the values for which LPC was created and exists. I am asking that Lot 858's designation be rejected at this time and that in the future when LPC has cleaned up its inexperienced, uh, it, its inexplicable behavior and helps me clean up the $4 million litigation which it has pr helped promote, that it can be once again be considered for landmarking. If anyone here believes an aluminum siding new storefront um, befits 95 Madison Avenue versus the least required restoration as per the architect Walter B. Melvin uh, and his master plan of which 50% is complete the 29th Street section and a third is, in, it is on order the building entry then I would submit that they don't belong in this room or anywhere near anything called restoration or landmarking. Nothing will be lost by the action I request. Do not designate my property and my f and my help my family and help us uh, stand to win a significant lease um, obligation of more than $14 million. By doing this, you lose nothing at all. You can come back and recalendar and reschedule my property for landmarking. In the interim, we, since 1970, have maintained and restored this property above landmark standard without anyone twisting our arm and without applications or anything else. There's another section of our restoration that is now in progress, and it stands to be completely trashing my building if you people do not reject this, this application at this time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Panel, any questions? One question, if that's okay. Okay. So you're, you, you have testified that you are opposing the designation, but you mentioned specifically and in detailed the process by which you receive notification. Is that your biggest uh, concern, is how LPC went about notifying you? Absolutely not. They went behind my back. I'm a single owner. I am completely involved in the details of all the curves, all of the metal, the stone, and everything. They specifically met with people who presented a picture that had one door, all aluminum, aluminum siding to match the garbage that's there now. My lease specifically requires restoration and shows five pages, and those five pages indicate 
a check and a check and a circle and a circle, a manual. But that meant that they had to match the existing four windows that were there. I stood and did a lease in a very narrow period of time with a tenant who I absolutely believed in. They changed their mind. They want to put in the cheapest garbage that they can and get on with their lives. The picture that's shown in their plan is a single aluminum siding door. They went to Landmarks and Landmarks said, oh, put in two doors and a little transom and it can be existing, which means aluminum siding. If anyone in this room believes in landmarking and believes that there is any owner who isn't only interested in saving money and pretending to do a faux job, then you don't belong here. I and my family have spent huge amounts of extra money through these years that I've had stewardship. I am at the end of this period, and the last segment that I'm working on is the ground floor master plan as designed by Walter B. Melvin, who's a preeminent now retired architect. His plan is in the hands of landmarks. We showed it to a committee of people. The second section that we're working on is now getting the courtyard unit, which is purely utilitarian with our AC, et cetera. They've approved my um, using uh, the back area. I need the ability to say, in terms of my litigation, that I don't care if you landmark me in four months from now. It makes zero difference to me. I don't care if you don't. But right now, to approve this after what's happened, where they have absolutely put a $14 million lease plus $3.5 million in investment at risk. If this is the purpose of an organization, not to landmark a building, but to destroy the financial stability of a building, it's a disgrace. I understand. Thank you so much for your testimony today. That's all the questions I have. Chair Adams. Thank you very much, Council Member. Thank you, Ms. Glor, for your testimony today. We're going to resume with LPC at this point. You are still under oath. Thank you very much. Now moving to Sunset Park, Brooklyn. And just for a little bit of context, um, at the request of Councilmember Menchaca um, and the Sunset Park Landmarks Committee, LPC has been serving a large part of the Sunset Park community and our analysis is ongoing. One of the buildings that we identified as eligible for designation through that process is the Dr. Maurice T. Lewis House, which was designed by New York architect R. Thomas Short and constructed in 1907. The restrained Renaissance Revival style building is a fine example of the early 20th century residential architecture and is a significant example of single family residential development in a neighborhood comprised mostly of row houses. On March 6, 2018, the Landmarks Preservation Commission voted to designate the Dr. Maurice T. Lewis House as an individual landmark, having held a hearing on the designation that day. 30 people spoke in favor, um, including Council Member Carlos Menchaca, a representative of, um, of Congresswoman of Alaska's, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, Historic Districts Council, and residents of Sunset Park. Community Board 7 and Lot Community Development Center submitted written support, and no one spoke um, or submitted a statement in opposition to the designation. The building is located in Brooklyn's Sunset Park neighborhood on the corner of 55th Street and 4th Avenue. The Sunset Park neighborhood developed in the late 19th, late 19th and early 20th centuries as a residential community for the working waterfront of South Brooklyn. The neighborhood is largely made up of speculative, speculatively built row houses and primarily developed for the working and middle class families. Um, as illustrated in this map, development in the area was largely complete um, by 1916. The Lewis House stands out in the neighborhood due to its refined architectural character and prominent siting. At the turn of the 20th century, 4th Avenue was a grand boulevard with a landscape median lined with churches, trees, and mixed-use buildings. This 1905 postcard looking north towards 54th Street shows the avenue's original design and the site where the Lewis House would eventually be constructed in the empty lot on the right. Dr. Lewis began a career in banking while continuing his 38-year-long practice as a physician. He was a founder, trustee, and eventually president of the Bay Ridge Savings Bank, which was located just a block away on 5th Avenue. 
Dr. Lewis commissions our, commissioned R. Thomas Short of the firm Hard and Short to design his new home. Hard and Short began their partnership in 1901 and were prominent New York City architects in the early 20th century. For the Lewis House, Short used a restrained Renaissance revival style, evoking a Renaissance era villa. The elegant building stands out in the neighborhood, um, especially because so many of the um, other buildings were developer built row houses along the numbered streets. Given the significance of the Dr. Maurice T. Lewis House and the importance to the Sunset Park neighborhood, we recommend that the City Council uphold this designation. Um, now moving to East Harlem, um, I want to just give a little bit of context for the next three properties. Um, the LPC was part of the administration's multi-agency effort to plan for East Harlem's future. As you know, that plan was informed by recommendations from the East Harlem Neighborhood Plan put forward by a steering committee of elected officials, Community Board 11, and community stakeholders. The steering committee's recommendations included one that LPC, pres quote, preserve important East Harlem buildings and reinforce neighborhood character. LPC invested considerable resources into conducting a survey of the neighborhood, as well as reviewing the recommendations of the steering committee and local preservation organizations. Through this survey, LPC prioritized three properties for designation. They embody East Harlem's unique development history, recognize the civic institutions and businesses that help shape the lives of the neighborhood's many immigrant groups, and they are some of the most architecturally significant buildings um, in the neighborhood. The former Richard Weber Harlem Packing House is a historic meat market building in East Harlem, constructed in 1895 and originally part of a larger um, commercial slaughterhouse, meatpacking and retail complex. Designed by the architectural firm of Bartholomew and John P. Walther for the prominent butcher Richard Weber, this Romanesque revival and Renaissance revival style building is a fine example of 19th century architectural design and an intact reminder of East Harlem's commercial and industrial past. On March 27, 2018, the LPC voted to designate the, the building as an individual landmark, having, heard, having held a hearing on February 13, 2018. At that hearing and in written testimony, the commission received support from 10 organizations and individuals, including um, Borough President Gail Brewer, representatives from the New York Landmarks Conservancy, Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts, Historic Districts Council, Marcus Garvey Park Alliance, Alliance Landmark East Harlem, um, and East Harlem Preservation, Civitas, Lot Community Development, and two individuals. No one spoke in opposition. <laughs> the building is located on East 119th Street near the corner of Third Avenue. Richard Weber uh, was an English immigrant and started a small butcher shop in East Harlem in the late 1870s. The company was very successful and expanded in, into a large complex with a staff of 500. Uh, Weber maintained other businesses, and at the time of his death in 1908, he was described by the New York Times as one of the largest butchers in the city, if not the United States. Bartholomew and John Peter Walther designed the Meatpacking House, which was constructed in 1895. Active in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the architects specialized in warehouses, factories, and flats buildings, and designed a number of buildings in Upper Manhattan. The formal design and high quality craftsmanship of the six story brick and stone packing house presented a sophisticated public face for Weber's operations. The complex remained in use by the Weber Meat Packing Company until 1928, after which the building served a variety of functions. And even today, you can see the terracotta um, cow head reliefs re that refer to the building's original function. The building has a powerful presence on the streetscape, and given the significance and importance to the East Harlem neighborhood, we recommend that the City Council uphold this designation. Public School 109 was constructed in 1899 and transformed in 2015 into an affordable housing complex for local artists. It's architecturally and culturally significant as a progressive era elementary school designed by the superintendent of school buildings, Charles B.J. Snyder. At its public hearing on February 13th, 2018, and in written, written testimony, the commission received support from 10 organizations and individuals, including Borough President Gail Brewer, representatives of Civitas, Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District, Historic Districts Council, Landmark East Harlem, Lot Community Development Corporation, and the New York Landmarks Conservancy, as well as two local residents. PS 109 is located on East 99th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenues. 
Situated in between the German enclave of Yorkville to the south and the Italian section of East Harlem to the north, at the time of its construction, the blocks immediately surrounding PS 109 were filled with an extraordinarily diverse array of residents, many of whom worked in the neighborhood's industrial enterprises along the East River. Nearly half of the population was foreign-born, and the new immigrants had arrived in large numbers from Ireland, Germany, Italy, and Russia. Built during a time of burgeoning school enrollments and an increase in immigrant populations in East Harlem, PS 109's five stories can accommodate more than 2,000 students. The building is clad in limestone and brick with a stylistic expression that joins elements of late Gothic and French Renaissance and the order of Beaux-Arts planning. For only the second time um, at PS 109, Snyder used the H plan layout, which he adopted as the plan of choice for mid-block schools. Um, cutting through the whole block from East 99th to East 100th, 100th Street, the H plan consisted of parallel wings surrounding two street-facing street courtyard spaces and was intended to create large recreational areas while protecting students' access to light and air from future development of neighboring buildings. These courtyards were, haven, were havens on a site sandwiched between tenement housing and two elevated subway stations at 2nd and 3rd Avenue. This is the school right here in its original context. PS 109 played an important stabilizing role within the changing community of East Harlem throughout the 20th century, offering evening lectures and adult education classes and welcoming thousands of new Puerto Rican residents to the neighborhood. In the 1950s, the blocks immediately surrounding PS 109 were radically transformed by urban renewal and a NYSHA public housing project, the George Washington Houses. In the bottom left photograph from 1952, you can see PS 109 peeking out across partially cleared tenements on East 98th and 99th Street. PS 109 functioned as a school until 1996, when due to its poor condition, it was shuttered and threatened with demolition. Artspace, a nonprofit organization, began redeveloping the building in the mid-2000s, restoring its exterior while renovating its interior into artist housing and studio space that opened in 2015. PS 109 remains an important symbol of an early 20th century moment in which school architecture called on cosmopolitan historical traditions to enrich the lives of the entire community. After its award-winning rest restoration, it continues to be an important civic and cultural icon today. Given the significance of PS 109 um, and Albario's art space and importance to the East Harlem neighborhood, we recommend that the City Council uphold this designation. Benjamin Franklin High School, now the Manhattan Center for Science and Mathematics, located on Pleasant Avenue, is a Georgian revival school with neoclassical elements from 1942 that was built to house East Harlem's first high school. The school featured an experimental curriculum referred to as citizen-centered community education that was implemented and developed by the pioneering educator, sociologist, and East Harlem resident, Leonard Covello, to serve the diverse immigrant community of East Harlem. At the public hearing on February 13th, 2018, and in written testimony, the commission heard from 11 organizations and individuals, including the Office of uh, Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, Lot Community Development Corporation, Civitas, the Vito Marcantonio Forum, the New York City Landmarks Conservancy, uh, Historic, Distri Historic Districts Council, Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts, Landmark East Harlem, East Harlem Preservation, and, and from East Harlem residents. No one spoke in opposition. Located on the eastern edge of East Harlem, along the Harlem River, the school is bounded by Pleasant Avenue, East 116th, and the FDR Drive. Benjamin Franklin High School was built from 1940 to 42 and designed by Eric Kevin, the head architect of the new construction for the Board of Education. As head architect, Kevin oversaw the construction of more than 100 schools as New York um, City's school system expanded to meet increasing enrollments. The school has an impressive Georgian revival design with many classical details. The building is a significant feature of East Harlem's built environment with its riverfront location, <coughs> its placement just north of Jefferson Park, and the central positioning of the building's entrance on access with East 115th Street. Benjamin Franklin High School was constructed to be a highly visible feature of the community, reflecting a promise of broad community service through education. Franklin High School has had a significant impact on the social history of East Harlem and represents the rich history of social and political engagement of East Harlem in the mid-20th century. 
establishes East Harlem's first high school, um, not a trade or vocational high school. Under the leadership of the school leader activist um, Leonard Cavello, Benjamin Franklin High School was intended to be a citizen-centered community school that actively engaged its students and the broader community in social and political reform and provided the educational and recreational activities that are now expected in public education, but were rare at that time. Envisioned in the 1930s as a means to improve the opportunities of the Italian immigrant community through bilingual education and community engagement, Benjamin Franklin High School opened as a neighborhood as the neighborhood began to experience significant demographic changes. The completion of the purpose-built high school in 1942 allowed Covella to expand its educational program and better serve the community by providing free event space and 24-hour access, 24 access to the community. The school not only became an important space to ease the increasing ten, um, increasingly tense race relations faced in the community, but it also adapted its curriculum to meet the needs of the Puerto Rican migrants by providing orientations in Spanish, forming a Puerto Rican cultural club, and actively engaging the new families of East Harlem. Throughout the brief life of Benjamin Franklin High School as a community-centered school, Cavello and other progressive educators sought to strengthen and support their community and pr improve the social and economic conditions of the community. The building now houses the top-ranked Manhattan School for Science and Mathematics and the Isaac Newton Middle School and for Math and Science, positioned between the, the Harlem River, the park, and the dense neighborhood of Pleasant Village. Benjamin Franklin High School is a substantial presence in East Harlem and continues to play an important role in the city. Given the significance of the school and this building it's an, and its importance to the East Harlem neighborhood, we recommend that the City Council uphold this designation. And for the final one, um, we're going to Williamsburg, Brooklyn. The Dive Savings Bank of Williamsburg is a neoclassical building constructed between 1906 and 08 during the period of growth that occurred in the neighborhood after the completion of the Williamsburg Bridge in 1903. Designed by the prominent Brooklyn architect firm of Helmley and Huberty, the building is a significant example of the early 20th century savings bank that used a grand classical design to evoke a sense of security, prosperity, and civic pride among a largely low-income immigrant community. At its public hearing on March 6, 2018, and in written testimony, the commission received support from five organizations and individuals, including the property owner, council member Antonio Reno Reynoso, Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez, and representatives of the Historic Districts Council and the New York Landmark Conservancy. The building is located at the corner of Havermeyer Streets and South Fifth Street. Um, industry flourished in Williamsburg along the East River waterfront during the mid-19th century, and numerous savings banks were established for the growing immigrant population to encourage thrift. Incorporated in 1864 by a group of prominent community members, the Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg occupied a few small offices before moving to its new headquarters. Um, their original building is no longer extant. In 1903, the completion of the Williamsburg Bridge shifted the neighborhood's financial center from Lower Broadway, outlined in blue on the map, to the Williamsburg Bridge Plaza at the bridge approach, outlined in red. The Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg acquired two corner lots facing the plaza in 1906 and commissioned the architectural firm of Helmley and Huberty to design its new headquarters. Several designated New York City landmark bank buildings are located in the vicinity of the Williamsburg, excuse me, Williamsburg Bridge Plaza, as you can see in this map. Hemley and Huberty um, were distinguished Brooklyn architects known for designing banks, park buildings, and churches. After the New Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg headquarters opened in 1908, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle boasted that the completed structure readily commends itself as one of the most attractive financial institution buildings in the city. The monumental Indiana limestone building has many classical architectural details. This circa 1910 image, it, image captures the Williamsburg Bridge Plaza as viewed from the designated Williamsburg Trust Company building. The Dime Savings Bank is visible on the far right um, by the red arrow, um, occupying one of the most prominent positions on the plaza. Modern transportation corridors have since divided the plaza into several distinct sections, but the remaining bank buildings recall a time when opulent financial institutions provided the backdrop to the bridge approach. In 1923, the bank's trustees purchased two lots behind the property to enlarge the building. Completed in 1925, the addition nearly doubled the size of the bank and blended in seamlessly with the original building by extending the articulated side elevation on South Fifth to the neighboring row house. The building, uh, which retains a high level of integrity, has a strong presence in the neighborhood and is significant for, 
for its elegant design and history associated with Williamsburg Historic Financial Center. Given the significance of the Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, we recommend that the City Council uphold this designation. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Savage, your extensive te testimony today <laughs> <laughs> on all of these very beautiful uh, historic properties. Um, uh, again, we in the City of New York should be very, very proud that we are home to these buildings. They are absolutely beautiful. So thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, panel, are there any questions at this point? Okay, are, you may be excused. Thank you. Are there any more members of the public that wish to testify on behalf of any of these items today? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on these items. We will lay over LU 115 and I will call for a vote in accordance with the recommendations of the local council members to approve LUs 116, 117, 118, 119, 120, and 121. Council, please call the roll. Adams. Aye. Barron. I vote aye. Crew. Aye. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, the items are recommended for approval from the full land use committee. And do you want to hold the vote open? We will hold the vote open for about 15 minutes. All right, just to advise the panel and the audience, we will revisit uh, LU 115 tomorrow morning. What time? 10.45. Uh, I'd like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, council, and land use staff for attending today's hearing. This meeting is open. Thank you. <laughs>